For today's meditation, let us turn to Luke chapter 4, verses 13. In the past several months, we have been going through the series, looking unto Jesus. And uh, the last time uh, we talked about Jesus entering into public ministry, starting with this public baptism. Uh, we focused on everything that happened at the River Jordan and then about Jesus being full of the Spirit, being led into the wilderness and being tested by the enemy. And also we covered Jesus opening up that uh, portion from Isaiah and, and declaring that the Spirit has anointed him. Hallelujah. There's one portion in all of that that as I was meditating that I felt like need to be highlighted. Uh, and, I, uh, and let's turn there. Luke chapter 4 verse 13 says, that when, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The enemy does have a, a sense of time. The enemy is seeking to seeking an opportune time to destroy each one of us. He sought an opportunity, an opportune time to catch Eve alone, to deceive her. He went as far as trying to catch an opportune time, at least in his mind, to get Jesus when he was hungry and weary and alone in the wilderness, to make him doubt his identity. And to find an evil shortcut to the end result, which was the exaltation of Christ and, father, and, and fulfilling the Father's will through that. But Jesus was armed with scripture, as we know, to counter in, uh, the enemy in this time of testing. So we need to understand that if the enemy can go after Jesus, he can go after each one of us. Any place, any time. And we need to be aware of that. Now, when we look, when we go through just quickly through the, you know, when we see how Jesus interacted with the demons before they were rebuked out of people, these demons would say, well, one day will first try to declare that Jesus is Messiah, and Jesus would say, be quiet. But also, some of them said, are you here before the time to torment us? So from this we know that Satan and his demonic forces know their future. They know there's a time appointed for them where Jesus will send them to eternal torment. So the enemy that we have is a defeated enemy. The enemy that we have is an enemy that has nothing to lose. Nothing is more dangerous than a person or entity that has nothing to lose. All the rules are out the window. All the tactics are now in play because they have nothing to lose. They have already lost. So the enemy will try everything in his power to avoid us from following the path of Christ. He's looking for maximum damage in the body of Christ so that the world will look at believers and say, look at that and, and, and mock us because we fell into the trap of the enemy. So understanding the enemy's tactics will help us to walk in wisdom and to be vigilant against the schemes of the enemy. Although there's a lot to speak about the enemy's tactics, I, I really felt led to spend the remainder of my time to, to, to focus on Jesus and his relationship with time while he was on this, and while he was on this earth. And how through Jesus, we should be able to see the factor of time Differently, So the, the title of my message is Jesus and Time. You know, when Paul tried to describe in a very deep sense the supremacy of Christ over all things, he says this in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 17, that he is the imis, image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul also says in Galatians 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So the one who existed before time, the creator of time, the sustainer of time, into the How to make best use of our time. Through Jesus, and only through Jesus, we can redeem our time. Our time is short. Jesus waited 30 years to begin his earthly ministry. In a mere three and a half years, he taught people, healed the sick, he trained the disciples. He fulfilled all righteousness so that he will be the ultimate sacrifice to redeem sinful mankind. So three days after death, as we know, he rose from the dead and spent 40 days with the disciples, reminding them of the things that he taught them. And after he ascended to heaven, he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus had a keen sense of his hour, starting with the, beginning with the start of his ministry. So, so God willing, you know, in the future we'll cover the wedding in Cana and how Jesus told Mary that his hour had not yet come. But that is one of the things that Jesus said over and over again is that my hour has not yet come. Jesus had a keen sense of timing when it came to when the Father wanted to glorify him. Jesus didn't want his miracles being, being publicized because in his mind it was all a stumbling block to... Fast forwarded. The, one of the most familiar examples of this is, is, you know, raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, we know, Jesus purposely waited to Lazarus, for Lazarus to pass away. And then he went to their house so that the people there will know that Jesus is the resurrection and life. It, the purpose, as we see in Jesus praying to the Father before, right before the, la, the, the resurrection of Lazarus, is that it's praying to the Father that use this moment to glorify your name and your son, that you have sent his son into this world. So Jesus being glorified and in our life is the best thing for not just us, but for all of humanity. Because there's no one more beautiful and valuable who can be magnified in all the universe. If an outcome results in the glory of Jesus, that is the best outcome. It doesn't matter how other people judge the outcomes of your life, whether good, bad, or indifferent. The ultimate outcome is graded by God. He is the ultimate judge. He is the source of everything. He's the source of wisdom. He's the source of all that is good and holy. What he says is what, is, what counts. What everybody else says about you or about the circumstances of your life is temporal as their own opinion. The opinion of people change day to day. The people that say you're great one day will reevaluate you and say you're the worst. This is, this, this is what we encounter in our workplace, isn't it? Isn't, this is what we encounter in our schools. And we're constantly in a mode of trying to, to uh, keep a level of uh, uh, a reputation. We're over, in, in overdrive trying to keep a level of reputation about our smartness, our competence, our value. All the more yet forgetting that we are answerable to only one being and that is God. That every activity, private and public, is seen by this one God. Yet we live our life for the eyes of everybody else around us. The eyes of social media, the eyes of our family, the eyes of community. I'm not saying those things don't matter as much. I'm saying that don't, do not make that the idol of your life. Because at one point or another, each of us have gone through a situation in our life where people have completely misunderstood us. Misunderstood our motives, misunderstood our, our intentions, our integrity. In those testing moments, 
we understood one thing that we can only trust as we sang today trust in Jesus trust in God who knows my heart so these times will come especially against you and me brothers and sisters as children of God in this dark and fallen world hallelujah you know when Jesus said mentioned about his hour and his time and then the gospel writers would comment that his time had not yet come if he escaped persecution or he slipped through the crowds there were so many instances where Jesus could have been arrested Jesus himself said that why are you coming with clubs and swords when you could have just easily captured me at any time but he of course was making a point that my father did not allow that to happen because it was not my hour hallelujah let me just fast forward and and just uh, show one verse where we see a, a deep trinitarian insight about how the hour this hour related to Jesus John chapter 12 27 through 29 Jesus says now my soul is troubled what shall I say father save me from this hour but for this purpose purpose I have come to this hour father glorify your name was for this hour from the start of his earthly life to that moment it has been something that he carried with it, car it was heavy in his heart we know the incident where Philip uh, and uh, and another disciple come Andrew comes to Jesus with the hey some Greeks want to uh, want to see you and Jesus, that's, what, that's kind of one of the verses after that is what we, I just read. Jesus knew that it was the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. And for that, that didn't mean that it was the hour for Jesus now to, to reach out to the Greeks and expand his ministry. He knew that he came for the lost sheep of Israel. And that other tasking was for the disciples who Jesus said that you will bear much fruit. You will do things far above what I have been able to do, I will empower you by my spirit to accomplish a task to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But Jesus knew that his purpose was for this hour. And there it says, a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus said that that voice was not for his own reassurance. It was so that he would be glorified to the people around. That they will know that the Father is testifying to the Son, to about his Son to these people. So Jesus' focus on time in his hour had everything to do with the glory of God. And that is where I want to go from here is our relationship with time. Whatever the amount of time that we have has to deal with how can we glorify God? Every minute, every second, every breath that we take, we do all things for the glory of God. Jesus did it. Jesus showed how he glorified the Father and how the Father glorified him for that, through that hour. So let me just take a moment just to remind us of how does the timing of God apply to us today? How, how has the time, the God's time, been applicable in our life? First of all, the gospel came to us on time. The gospel came to our genera generations past on time. Our grandfathers, grandmothers, great-grandfathers, great-grandmothers, however your lineage is, or maybe it was you. As I read in the, in the verse in Galatians, that in the fullness of time have come, had come, Jesus came into this earth. It was in the right time, in the right place. If you, you know, one of the things I thought, the thought about is, you know, what if Jesus came right now? There are a lot of issues that would prop up because of the kind of media and other things that we have. 
there's an added challenge, but God chose the right exact time period, human time period to come in that time. The timing of God is on time. It is perfect in the same way. The timing of God came to each one of our lives. The gospel was what came into our generations, our past, our, our grandfathers, grandmothers, parents, us. Do not, do not discount the time when you came to know Jesus. He was on time. There's a story weaved into all these things that in the right time, Jesus was revealed in your heart. The second thing, first is the gospel came to us at the right time. Second thing, our exaltation will be at the right time. First Peter chapter 5, 6 to 8. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. There's a lot to unpack here. One of the, you know, our anxieties and pride of life, it, it has a way of, of getting ahead of God's timing. The enemy uses our anxieties. The enemy uses our pride. And our enemy uses our, 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 menta- our, uh, our tendency to take care of things on our, with our own might. So that we will stumble and do things that were not in the timing of God. But at the same time, many of us have made decisions, poor decisions. A lot of things delayed in our life because of that. All, that, all those things are a reality. But even if the enemy meant something for evil, God has a way of redeeming even the bad decisions in our life and turning it into good. Yes, things, things may have played out in a way that was not ideal, but God has a way of giving and restoring you, restoring your past and, and, and reestablishing you if you repent, if you turn to Him. But if you go in a pattern of walking away from Him, don't just have a blind hope, thinking that one day you will turn around. If I go a little bit deeper... The principle of the gospel in allowing exaltation in our lives is what we see in Philippians chapter 2. You, each of you know that. If you have the mind of Christ, if you follow the footsteps of Christ, he humbled himself as a servant, he became obedient to the point of death, and in his time, and, and because he did that, it says, therefore the Father highly exalted him, Gave him the name that was above every other name. Now in our life, we have to go through a death. We have to go through spiritual uh, or a, a death of our flesh. We have to go through humiliation. Sometimes like Jesus did. We have to endure crosses in our life. We have to carry some thorns in our flesh. And we have to get, go through some difficulties so that the mind of Christ becomes activated in our life. That through that, we will learn a lot of great things about God. That the exaltations will come as a result in due time. I'm of the mind that we won't be able to consider others better than ourselves without the, the journey of trials. We won't be able to love our enemies or bless our enemies without going through the path of suffering. These, all these things are there so that we can form the mind of Christ. And it's not that one day you're exalted, now that you're, everything is good to go. No, we go on a continuous repeat, rinse and repeat, you know, of, of this, of, 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 of death, humiliation, and exaltation. Death, humiliation, exaltation. Or exal- humiliation, death, exaltation. We, this is a cycle of our life. And God is doing a work in us. That work doesn't stop. Until we are once and for all glorified. Lastly, and the worship team can come forward. His coming will come at the right time. If you go to 
2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 onwards. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in, on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people are you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on, uh, on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We all need to be reminded of, reminders of that fact. Don't think that God, the Lord is slow or the Lord is too fast. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. He will come like a thief, unexpected. We cannot predict the ways of God, especially in His coming. So as believers, as non-believers, even those listening to me out there, know that Jesus is coming back. What should we do? If you're an unbeliever, if you don't believe in Jesus, there's a, a grace, a common grace that's given to each one of us to live on this earth. The sun will rise, the sun will set. You, you have oxygen to breathe. Your life is uh, going well according to your own judgment. But there is a a greater grace, a grace that is given to those to be saved and to know Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Behold, now is a favorable time. Now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do not wait for tomorrow. Do not wait for the next moment. Today, right now, as you breathe right now, the Lord is speaking to you and asking you and pleading with you and telling you, to come to Jesus. Amen. If you are somebody that you, you call yourself a believer and you are walking away from the Lord. There are multiple verses on this. Romans chapter 13 verse 11. The hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. The salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. The ultimate day of salvation where Jesus comes back. And once and for all glorifies the saints. That day is one day nearer. It is time for you and me. If you are wa walking in slumberness. If you are sleeping right now to wake up. There's not much time left. And it says in, in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16. Make best use of the time because the days are evil. Walk carefully. How you walk. Not as unwise but wise. Verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. There is not enough time left. There is not enough time left. Jesus who knew and understood the value of time. Let us walk in the footsteps of Christ and understand the value of time. We don't have much time left. Do not, do not slumber. Do not sleep. Be awake. And finally, for believers, all of us endure trials and suffering. Psalm 31, 14 to 16. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servants. Save me in your steadfast love. My times are in your hands, Lord. Let us look to the Lord this morning. I know there are many categories of people sitting here and watching us. I pray that the Lord is speaking intently and closely to every heart. But I want to pray for those, especially in the congregation here, believers that are going through trials and suffering. Let us look to the Lord and let us say, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. You are my God. 
my times are in your hand. Every, every second of my life is in your hand. Rescue me, Lord, from the enemy. Rescue me, Lord, from temptations. Rescue me, Lord, from the trials that can weaken me. Help me to be faithful until the end. Let your face shine on your servant, Lord. Save me, Lord, in your steadfast love. Help me to see you face to face one day, Lord. In the face of trials, in the face of suffering, help me not to fall away from the faith. But I pray that your steadfast love that endures forever will be upon me, Lord. I pray, Lord, for a special blessing over this congregation upon everybody listening here this morning, Lord. I pray that we will number our days so that we may have a heart full of wisdom, Lord. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to count time. Teach us to be wise. Jesus, be our good teacher. Give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.